Hello, everyone. I'm J.D. Seal, and I'm the Vice President at Skyview Partners, and I'm happy to be here with you this morning to uh, introduce our session today on the 12 sections of PCI DSS and how each relates to the IBM I community, presented today by Carol Woodbury. In our Coffee with Carol session, Carol draws on her experience consulting with Skyview Partners clients and helping them with their PCI DSS implementation and compliance requirements. Carol explains each of the 12 sections of the payment card industry data security standards and describes specifically how each relates to the IBM I community. Today's session is sponsored by Skyview Partners. Sky, here at Skyview Partners, we are committed to delivering products and services that not only provide our customers with sound advice, but also saves them time, reduces the cost, and simplifies the management of security compliance, including the daily security administration tasks they have to do. Carol Woodbury is the co-founder, president, and CTO of Skyview Partners. Prior to forming Skyview, six, she, Carol spent 16 plus years at IBM in positions including chief engineering manager and security architect for IBM's iSeries security group. She is also author of the book, IBM I, Security, Administration, and Compliance, available at MC Press Online. Skyview Partners has various solutions that can help you from a software perspective. Our Skyview Risk Assessor for IBM I, an automated independent vulnerability assessment. Skyview Policy Minder, automated security administ administration tool. Skyview Audit Journal Reporter, predefined auditor-ready reports, and the new Skyview Policy Minder for IBM AIX. Also, recently we've begun at Skyview Partners making available an unlimited corporate license. So if you're interested in that, please let me know. And my finger got carried away here and I jumped a couple of screens. Sorry about that. Um, Skyview Partners also has various services available. The Skyview Security Checkup, where we actually work with you to review your vulnerability. And also available for IBM AIX our managed services for compliance reporting, as well as various re-architecture and remediation services on a statement of works basis. So with that, I will turn the presentation over to Carol on 12 sections of PCI DSS and how each relates to the IBM I community. Good morning, Carol. Good morning. Thanks for joining us, everybody, and uh, taking time to have coffee with me this morning. So I thought I would do a refresher on PCI and I community because even though we might think that PCI is a uh, done deal, it's actually something that has to be done annually for those people who take on credit cards. And there are new people that are coming under the guise of PCI compliance all the time as they begin a new venture, perhaps, and start taking credit cards for payments and so forth. So I thought maybe a refresher was due. So what we'll do today is just uh, have a quick review of what PCI actually is. Um, PCI is not from some government. Rather, it's the payment card industry, and it's actually a consortium of the various credit card companies, along with industry experts in the area. So there is a good mix of both the banks, uh, retailers, and industry experts that comprise this consortium. And what it really has formed then is this PCI Security Council, and there's the website for them. They are putting out standards. They said that they would put out a standard no more often than every two years, so no revisions for at least two years. But what they are doing, and we'll see at the end of this presentation, they're putting out guidance for various parts of PCI compliance. So last month they put out guidance for e-commerce, it's very specific to e-commerce applications. And there's just notification out this morning that they are putting out guidance on cloud services. So while there may not be specific updates to the standards all that often, they are a very active organization and they are constantly keeping on track of 
where the current issues are and how best to help people come into compliance with their standards. So the standards have a set of regulations. Those regulations are then levied on the processing banks. So it's not actually, if you get a PCI audit, it's not actually directly from the PCI standard or from the council itself. It's actually from the bank that processes your credit card information. So the council levies the requirements on the banks. The banks, in turn, levy those requirements onto each of those organizations that retain or process those credit cards. So that's really the flow of the hierarchy, if you will. So the PCI DSS, or the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standards, if you read the standard itself, it is comprised of 12 separate requirements. And they are in six uh, overall sections. And so we're going to go through each of those 12 requirements. And I'm not going to read the actual standards itself. That could really put you to sleep more so than just a normal presentation, but we will go through in detail and then discuss what the ramifications are to the IBM I world. So the first of the 12 requirements is the, the overall section is called build and maintain a secure network. So there are the two requirements. So install and maintain a firewall configuration to protect cardholder data. That one's pretty obvious. It, it, this has direct impact on the network, but really doesn't have a whole lot of impact on the IBM I community, other than the fact that you clearly want to have a firewall in your network to protect the outside from coming to your inside network. And that's, uh, I don't know of anybody who hasn't set that up these days. So that, that one's pretty obvious and not a lot of work for the IBM I community. The requirement two says do not use vendor supply defaults for system passwords or other security parameters. And the context of this requirement is really in the context of the network where it talks about using default firewall passwords and router passwords and so forth. You know, everybody can relate to the um, default password in your router, right? If anybody has set up their home network, their wireless network, whatever vendor you have chosen to use, your router has a default password from the vendor. So of course, if you don't change that, then anybody trying to surf on your network at home is going to be able to um, do so quite easily. Well, the same applies to the network in your organization where you work, but it also applies to the IBM I in in that there should be no default passwords on your systems. So especially the IBM I passwords for system supply profiles, things like uh, QSEC offer, Q programmer, Q user, those sort of things, those are well-known profiles. And those would be the ones that people would try first to try to gain access to the system if they didn't have uh, access themselves. The, thing, the other things that apply to the IBM I are, uh, are not in use. So if you have looked on IBM I recently, the types of network services that are available are vast. So certainly if you're not going to be using something like FTP or DDM, um, they should be turned off. So take a look at those TCP IP servers. If they're not in use, they should be shut off. The other thing that comes in uh, here is implementing security best practices for things like system values and other configuration settings. So obviously there are some better ways to set up your system. Certainly running at security level 40 is where you want to be, uh, not 20 or 30, that type of thing. The other thing, and this is kind of in the spirit of if it's not needed, don't keep it around. That would be getting rid of all of your unused products directories. If it's on your system, 
it has to be considered from a security perspective. So the better thing is to get rid of it. And finally, uh, there is the requirement to encrypt all administrator non-console access. So that translates into making sure that if you are a profile that has all object, which is the definition of an administrator on IBM I, that any type of access to the system needs to be over an encrypted session. So that typically means running an SSL enabled Telnet session or IBM I navigator or whatever connection uh, method you're using it needs to be encrypted. So the next section is the overall title is called Protect Cardholder Data. And so the third requirement is uh, prote protect stored cardholder data. So there's different ways that cardholder data needs to be protected. One of it is when the cardholder data is in transit, all right, and that's requirement four. But requirement three is talking about when the cardholder data is at rest. Or in our terms, it would be in an, a DB2 database, or if it is stored in a stream file in the IFS, or it, if it's in a data area, any place that those that cardholder data is retained and stored, it needs to be encrypted. So this requirement defines what data can be stored. And if you look at any of the past breaches, especially things like uh, uh, TJX is one of the famous ones. They're kind of the poster child of being hacked and having their credit card information abused, if you will. One of their issues is that they stored some of the track data. And that is never, 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 never to be stored. So it, you only want to keep the information that is allowed by the PCI. And if you don't need to retain even that much, all the better. So it defines what can be stored. It defines the encryption requirements, so the strength of the encryption, as well as the encryption key management requirements. And that is one thing that I want to make sure that I point out is that it may seem easy. Um, IBM I provides APIs to do the encryption so that you might be tempted to encrypt the data yourself. But one of the things that is very difficult to manage, and again, IBM I provides the APIs for encryption key management, but that is not a trivial process. And so there are vendors that know how to do this process. Uh, they've got it down to a science, they make it usable, and I would really highly recommend that you use, use one of the vendors that works with IBM iData so that you can uh, make sure to get that key management in a method that actually complies with PCI requirements. Doing that on your own is not an easy task. So the encryption of the data is actually not that difficult. It's the key management that will trip you up and will cause you difficulty going down the road. Okay, the next section is called Maintain a Vulnerability Management Program. So requirement five, usually it says, uh, use and regularly update antivirus software. So the question is, does this apply to IBM I? Well, uh, a few years ago, Pat Boats and I wrote a white paper on viruses and the IBM I, and it talks about how the IBM I is virus resistant. So there is documented evidence, and uh, IBM, even on their own website, talks about the virus resistance of the IBM I. However, the IBM I it to very nicely hold viruses, specifically in the IFS. And so it, I have not heard of an issue in a very long time. However, it's not impossible to think that a virus that is floating around in the, in the wild, if you will, could be stored in the IFS. So it, I've heard some of the auditors for uh, PCI, and those auditors are called QSAs, 
So I've heard some of them require an antivirus software be run over the IFS, and I have heard some dismiss it. So that is one thing that you're going to have to work with your QSA to determine whether or not that is a requirement. So the next thing is uh, develop and maintain secure systems and applications. So this definitely has implications to the IBM I. One of the things that they state in the PCI DSS is that they want to see up-to-date security patches. So when they say security patches, that really translates into our PTFs. And what their recommendation is, is that they be applied within one month. So if you think about it in terms of IBM I, that's those integrity PTFs that IBM puts out occasionally. Not very often, thank, thank goodness for us. So um, their requirement is to put it on within one month. That might not actually be what your policy requirements are. Um, you may apply PTFs. Uh, in, in a bit different time frame. If you can document the reasons why you don't put PTFs on that quickly, and specifically the integrity PTFs, um, you might be able to get by with this and not have it be within a month. But certainly you would want to make sure that you are monitoring for new integrity PTFs and new hyper PTFs. Um, IBM has a service that notifies you when those come out. I would make sure that you're on that service so that you can make sure to, to be up to date on your security patches and have a documented process for how you manage those. The other place that this requirement comes into play with IBM I is specifically in the development community. And somehow I've talked to a lot of development groups in my days, and I have talked to more than one of them that feels that this requirement doesn't apply. And nothing can be farther from the truth. If your programming group is writing the application that touches the credit card information, they have they fall under this requirement. So the idea is that the PCI DSS requires that applications be developed with security best practices in mind. They require code reviews of the code that is being uh, put out that, again, that touch the, the credit card information. Change, recall, change control is required. It requires separate production and test environments. Um, and the guidelines that they talk about for how you do secure coding practices can come from another uh, several different areas. It used to be just the OWASP group that they cited, but they have uh, now also listed the SANS organizations, CERT, and others. So if you have a specific set that you use, uh, a national organization that you code to, um, you could define that and document that, and they, your QSA may accept that. But the point here is that um, IBM I developers don't get a pass on this one. They must comply with this. Uh, the other thing is that if your application is a web application that's running on IBM I, and it is externally facing, meaning that somebody can hit that from the internet, then the externally facing application has to be at least annually examined, um, either from an automated code perspective or physically examined by um, experts in the industry to make sure that there are no vulnerabilities from known attacks. Now, this whole thing sounds probably worse than it is, although I, I think it's a, a good idea for IBM I to have a rigid process and process. Some of these things can come from automated tools, like the externally facing applications, having them be 
uh, examined can uh, that can come from an outside source and that can be automated so you probably don't want to do it just annually you'd probably want to do it like quarterly to look for various vulnerabilities the other thing is that um, especially if you are writing a, a web application that touches your credit card information there are tools in place that will scan the code to look for vulnerabilities. So I don't care whether you're writing on the IBM I or Windows or Linux or what you're writing on. If you are writing a web application, then you are using the same coding techniques because it all runs on a web server. So these automated tools will look for things like cross-site scripting errors, SQL injection uh, vulnerabilities, and so forth. So there's the automated tools run on not just other platforms, but they also, because of the type of code that's being written, also run for co against code that's going to be run on an IBM I web server. So um, they're out there. They need to be used. IBM I does not get a pass on this. Okay, the next section talks about implementing strong access control measures. So requirement number seven talks about restricting access to cardholder data by a business need to know. So this is analogous to having a, a, an IBM I application where you restrict certain users to only seeing certain menu items. I mean, this is a concept that we have had in the IBM I world forever. Um, but this is specifically relating to cardholder data or that credit card information. So the point here and the idea that they're trying to get across is the only people that should have access to the credit card information and especially the full credit card information are only those individuals that have a business need to actually see that data. So they're espousing this concept called deny by default, which means that access to credit cards will be by default denied. And then you go back in and specifically authorize users that need to have access to those processes that allow that information to be, be, be decrypted and uh, used by an individual. The other thing that they want to see is this concept of least privilege access. So again, on the IBM I, this is, in my opinion, a significant problem because a lot of times users haven't given capabilities that aren't appropriate for what they need to do for their job. So I have seen end users and programmers and people outside of the operations group have a special authority called SaveSys, for example, which allows you to save anything off of the system, regardless of whether you have authority or not. So it's really would not be a good practice, and it certainly doesn't come into play for the least privileged access if end users have SaveSys saves a special authority because that gives them the authority to save off the credit card information. So that is a clear violation of PCI. So the idea is to only give users on the system only the capabilities and only the access that they need to implement their job and perform their job tasks and then make sure that the credit card information is denied by default. So that translates into making sure that your credit card information is public authority of exclude and making sure that any process that decrypts that information is also public exclude. Okay, on to requirement number eight. Assign a unique ID to each person with computer access. So this is a fairly um, narrow title, but when you dive into the details of what's being looked at under the covers, um, it actually hits the IBM I uh, quite a bit. Now, let me step back for a moment. I haven't shown you the actual PCI DSS requirements, 
but all of these um, bullets where I have said requirement number XXX, those come directly from the PCI DSS. And if you look at the document itself, you'll, they'll, you'll see these headings, but under it, it's like they have subcategories. And so that's where all of the sub bullets come from. And the document also has examples of what auditors are going to look for and expect for each of these sub bullets. So I haven't made up all of these sub bullets for what it means to, for example, requirement eight, assign a unique user ID to each person with computer access. These are actually coming directly from the PCI DSS. So what I've done is take the, the sub bullets that apply to our community and I have translated those into what they mean to us. So as I said, that heading sounds pretty narrow, but when you dive into the sub bullets, it's actually fairly broad and has quite a bit of implications for our community. Okay, so let's go back into requirement eight. So the sub bullet says, uh, have a unique user profile to ensure accountability. This is where the sharing of user profiles is a violation of PCI DSS. Now, you may sit back and say, well, none of my end users don't share passwords or profiles, or it's our policy not to share profiles, and that's all well and good, but there are often some profiles that are shared by design. And it's been my experience that most people do that in the administration area and very often in the area of operations. And again, that is not appropriate for security best practices and it's clearly not allowed in PCI DSS. So what this means is that instead of signing on to the system as QSIS Opera, for example, uh, your operators should have an individual profile assigned to them and they should be signing on with that profile rather than uh, a, a generic. And the reason behind this is to not cause you pain and suffering. The reason behind this is the whole idea of accountability. If multiple people are signing on with the same user ID, then it is impossible to tell from a system auditing point of view who did which task. So if you're in a situation where you have one generic profile, um, I see it in timekeeping applications quite a bit. And so people use the same user ID and password and then they use it to enter timekeeping information for, their, for themselves. Um, and obviously in that situation, it's built into the application to use a generic user ID. Um, I see other places where they sign on and they do one specific task and it really is not anything to do with uh, anything individual task and they don't get access to a command line. If you are in a situation and have those types of scenarios, what you're going to need to do is document the fact that this one user profile is used for this one task and can't be used for anything else and that it is not an issue of accountability that this one profile is used repeatedly by many people. So there are some exceptions to this rule, but it has to be something where accountability doesn't matter. Okay, the next bullet talks about requiring authentication. So this is where, it, back in the day when you had uh, the ability to have a system at security level 10, um, and that dates me certainly. Um, security level 10, you could walk up and type in any username and get onto the system, and a password wasn't even allowed. So clearly that level, of the sec security level would not be allowed by PCI because it requires authentication. So now, anytime you sign on to the IBM I, regardless of the security level, you have to enter a password. So you either have to have 
a password, some sort of biometric like a, a fingerprint scan um, or a, a Kerberos ticket, something that proves that you are who you say you are. So it requires authentication to get onto the system. The next bullet talks about rendering all passwords unreadable. So, you know, all of us think about signing on and you can't see that password, so all passwords are unreadable, correct? Well, hmm, not exactly. Um, when you sign on to a 5250 emulation session, that password is actually passed to the system in clear text. So if that's the method your users are using to sign on to the system, um, you will need to use or enable SSL Telnet to ensure that no passwords are flowing in the clear. And why is this a big deal to PCI? The big deal is that uh, somebody could put a sniffer on your network and gather the passwords for users signing on to the system. And so they want to prevent that from happening. And so the only way to do that is to make sure that your communications are SSL enabled. The next implication for IBM I is that PCI requires a timeout of inactive sessions after 15 minutes of inactivity. So there's system values, the Q inactive timeout system value that PCI is going to look to see if it's set to 15 minutes. And I can hear the groans coming in over the webinar because there are people who have tried to set this system value and your applications have had either locks on them so other people can use the files because the session has become disconnected or your application has finished midway and the tra transaction hasn't actually been committed and you don't have commitment and rollback. So you've had a mess to clean up when sessions have timed out. I totally get that. And fortunately, most PCI auditors also totally get that. So if you, instead of timing out the IBM I session, most of the QSAs will allow you to time out the workstation. So if you're in a Windows network, for example, you can put a group policy on your devices and time out the device after 15 minutes of inactivity. And then basically it's the screen saver. So you enter the user name and uh, your network password again and you're back on. So you don't typically have to time out the IBM I session as long as you can time out the entire workstation. Okay, so blood pressure back down, take a sip of coffee, you probably can get by with this one, as long as it's on the network. Okay, the next bullet talks about who can manage user profiles, or they talk about user um, access, user accounts. So this is where you have to control in the IBM I world who has SEC admin special authority because that's what gives the user the ability to create user profiles, change user profiles, and so forth. The next bullet talks about verifying users prior to a password reset and I see more and more IBM shops accommodating this but I don't see this 100% by any means. So basically what this is meaning is that before your help desk or before your system administrators reset a password, um, they should be doing some sort of verification that the user is who they say they are. Now this one is, uh, I hear the excuse all the time, well we trust our users, they aren't going to try to do something. Eh. You know, one of the, the biggest social engineering techniques is calling up and pretending that you are somebody that you're not and you've guessed the naming convention of the user profiles, so now all you need is the password. And if you're in a significantly large organization where you don't personally know everybody, this could be a tactic that is used in your organization. So you really do need to do some sort of verification 
that the user is who they say they are uh, before the password reset is performed. The next bullet, uh, it talks about access being revoked immediately for terminated users. So most IBM I shops that I've seen have a process in place that if a user does get terminated, that uh, the user profile is immediately dis at least disabled, uh, if not immediately removed from the system. So that's good. The next requirement talks about users uh, being set to either status of disabled or removed from the system after a period of 90 days of inactivity. And this is a process that IBM I shops still struggle with. I see this all of the time. And um, we quite frankly help them do that with our policy minor product. Um, because I think a lot of people still struggle with not looking at the right date. Um, so a lot of people will still look at the last sign-on date, which is not an accurate reflection of profile usage. So this one is a definite requirement, but I still see people struggling with it. Another one, uh, another requirement is to enable vendor accounts only when needed. And I see more and more IBM I shops having this come under control. Um, and so good for you. And I encourage you to continue that process. Uh, vendors, unfortunately, like to have access to their customer systems. Why they would want that per per perpetual access and have that liability, it, to me, is I, I don't understand that. But some people want that perpetual um, access. And uh, my take is you want to know when the vendor is going to come onto your system. So it requires a phone call their profile needs to be re-enabled, and then they can come on when you know that they're coming on. But you need to take control of the access to your system, and, and if the vendor says that they need this, tell them you can't, and blame the regulation if you have to. But take control of when those vendors come on. And why? Because most vendors come on with a very powerful profile. So you don't want them on just any old time, because you know that there is a, if you don't do anything, you know that vendor company has a list of the, of the user account and the password being used for all of their customers. And it's a master list. So why do you want to be one of those people on that list? Take control of that one. Okay, so another one, no generic or shared accounts. Again, um, kind of covered in another section, but repeated here. The password requirements for PCI DSS is that the passwords have to be a minimum length of seven, require a digit, the same password can't be used for four password changes, and the password has to be changed every 90 days. And finally, if the user tries to guess their password um, and they miss six times, the profile needs to be disabled after those six invalid sign-on attempts. Okay, whew, requirement eight was kind of long there. So requirement nine says that you need to restrict physical access to cardholder data. So uh, this is implementation of physical security, so things like expecting that your systems are going to be in a locked computer room. Um, most IBM I shops I see have a visitor log, but you need to have some sort of visitor log or badge to make to identify who the visitors are. Um, things like the physical security of backups, they would prefer that backups be stored off-site in a controlled manner, obviously. Control access to any kind of media that contains credit card information. So the thing that you have to realize is that it's not just the IBM I. In this case, it's quite broad. So things like printed re reports, any kind of USB drive that might have a spreadsheet uh, that's where the credit card information has been downloaded, receipts, etc. So this is where you can reduce the scope of your project if you can remove that credit card information from a lot of these types of, of issues. So get it off of printed reports. Don't let it be downloaded into an Excel spreadsheet and so forth. And then the last bullet in this section talks about what to do with media when it's no longer required and there's 
credit card information has been stored on it. So they are requiring that it be um, erased with a standard that complies with NIST standards, and the IBM Disk Sanitizer does that. So if you have an IBM I where credit card information has been stored, I strongly recommend that you get the IBM Disk Sanitizer, and it comes as a, a, a PTF, I believe it is, with V6 and V7. It's a PRPQ prior to that, but it will overwrite your disk to the NIST standards so that data cannot be retrieved from the disk. Okay, requirement 10. The overall requirement or heading for this is monitor and test, test networks. So requirement 10 says track and monitor all access to network resources and cardholder data. What does that mean in IBM I terms? That means turning on IBM I auditing. So our recommendation from Skyview Partners is that you have at least the following setup. So your on-off switch for auditing is set to at least odd level, which means look in the odd level system value. The odd level system value says which actions will be audited. So we highly recommend that you have at least the authority failures, the creation and deletion of objects, security um, Secure sec run and sec config, which is things like uh, granting authorities, revoking authorities, creation of user profiles, and so forth, as well as the save restore and the use of service tools. We also uh, recommend, and actually as a requirement of PCI, that command auditing be turned on for anybody that has all objects. So, in terms again, PCI talks about administrative users that directly translates into any profile that has been given all object. So not just at the profile level, if the user is a member of a group that has all object, still applies to the members of those groups. So what you need to do is run the change user odd command and turn on command auditing for all of those users that have all object. Actually, the best process is to turn on command auditing for any user that has command line access. Not just the ones with all object, but best practices says turn it on for anybody that has command line access. PCI says for sure it has to be at least your administrators. Also, you will need to log all accesses to cardholder data. So that means uh, the best way to do that is to turn on journaling and to make sure that that is uh, turned on that or turn on object auditing uh, for both reads and uh, writes to the database. Now the next bullet is talks about securing your audit logs. Now here is a huge benefit of running the IBM I. The audit logs on other systems are just a flat file. So if you take a look at Unix or Linux, it's just a flat file. So anytime that audit log is out there, you have to do something to protect the integrity of that log, and that typically per, uh, is another product or another process or so forth. But the nice thing about IBM I is that our audit logs are protected inherently given the architecture of how they were implemented. The IBM I audit logs are implemented using journals and journal receivers. And the nice thing is that the way that journal receivers work is that you can't, there's no method, there is no physical way to actually remove an entry from an audit journal receiver. So the integrity of that data is inherent in the architecture. The other thing is that even if you delete an entire journal receiver, before that's done, an audit record is written to the current journal receiver. In addition, if you turn off audit, auditing altogether, we, we have a, an audit journal entry that we can look at that says that auditing has been turned off. So it's kind of self-documenting, if you will. So that's the cool thing. And not just anybody can delete an audit journal receiver. You have to have authority to do that and so forth. So secure the audit logs. Not an issue for us. You can just bypass that one. You may have to prove it to your auditor, um, 
that IBM is IBM I is architected that way. But the good news is that we get a pass on that one. The other thing is that, and again, this is in the context of monitoring, or in our terms, auditing. And they want the PCI DSS wants uh, the use of a network time server. So the reason that you want to use a network time server is so that all of the logging that goes on within your network uses the same time base. So if you have a router or a firewall and that internal clock is even five seconds off from your IBM I time and you needed to do some sort of correlation, say a breach occurred and you needed to do some intrusion analysis if your time clocks are off, <clears throat> then your logs are going to be off and you're not going to know the sequence of the events. So most of the IBM I shops have a network time keeper in their network. So you just have to use the change network um, time uh, and to point to that time keeper in your, in your network and all is good there. Now there is a, a requirement to review logs daily. Now what does that mean? <clears throat> it does not mean that you have to review every audit journal entry every day. Um, that would be physically impossible. But there is some expectation that you look for unexpected events every day. So things like changes to system values, inappropriate use of data. So what do I mean by that? Uh, things like authority failures to the either the processes that decrypt your information or the direct access of the files that are uh, holding your cardholder. It's like it, authority failures to try to use like, like uh, system profiles, uh, perhaps the invalid sign-on attempts for the IBM profiles and so forth. So there are a set of audit reports that we do recommend that you review on a regular basis. And again, those should be exception reports, so they should be empty. So if you see information on them, that it, you want to get it to the point that you really know that you should take action. The other audit journal requirement that usually hangs up some IBM I shops are the fact that you need to keep audit journal receivers for one year. Uh, most people have to adjust their save strategy so that their audit journal receivers are saved on quite often different media so that that specific media containing their audit journal receivers can be kept around for a year. So whether you save your audit journal receivers on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, whatever it is, you, PCI requires that you can go back a full year and restore those beats so that you can restore those audit journal receivers. And the whole idea is that you can do that in case of a breach. So most people have to adjust those save strategies. Requirement 11, again, still under the guise of regularly monitoring and testing networks. This is regularly test security systems and processes. This is penetration testing on an annual basis, ability scans of internal systems quarterly. What does this mean for IBM I? The penetration testing um, it is more of a security assessment, something like our security checkup service where we go and run our risk assessor product and that looks across the configuration of your IBM I from a very broad test um, and we'll look for the vulnerabilities and that satisfies uh, the penetration testing from an IBM I perspective. Penetration testing is more of a network term. The term that applies to IBM I is really the vulnerability assessment. Um, <clears throat> And then you can use the same uh, type of thing like our risk assessor for the vulnerability scans quarterly. Intrusion detection prevention at the perimeter and additionally at uh, critical points in the environment. So 
Um, obviously, there needs to be a firewall at your network perimeter. Um, you may need to work with your QSA to see if they are going to require technology called data loss prevention, or you may be able to use um, the uh, concept of the exit points to be able to sh shut down um, data that is going off your P or ODBC. Um, there's also some uh, functionality in application administration that allows you to control FTP and ODBC. Um, the last one is look for changes to critical system files weekly. So again, you have to look at the perspective of how this was written. Um, the PCI Council has very little knowledge, if any, of the IBM I, so they don't understand the fact that our operating system can't be modified by just anybody. Um, but if you look at more of a Linux system or a Windows system or a, a, a Unix system, they don't necessarily have all of the integrity features that we do. So. Uh, that one is more pervasive on the other operating systems. However, IBM has provided a command called check object integrity. And basically, it's a self-check for the operating system. So that's something that you could schedule to run in batch and verify that the operating system has not been modified. Now, this can be a CPU hog, if you will. So you would want to definitely schedule this command to run in batch and probably put it at a low priority and just let it run, let it run to completion. Um, but that would suffice for the need to monitor critical system files. OK, we're at the last requirement. Requirement 12 says, and the overall heading is, maintain an information security policy. So the specific requirement says maintain a policy that addresses information security. What does that mean to IBM I? Um, IBM I shops, especially the smaller shops, often don't have a security policy, but a, po a security policy is required by the PCI DSS. And you must make sure that that policy incorporates all the requirements of the PCI DSS. It also requires an annual risk assessment. Our security checkup does a nice job of fulfilling that requirement. Um, processes and procedures that implement the PCI DSS. So things like uh, the process of documenting how you create user profiles and how you have set them so that they are least privileged access. Things like making sure that any application that is written that touches credit cards um, have a secure coding process, what your change management process is, that type of thing. That's the type of thing that they're looking for, for the processes being documented. Also things like your patching strategy, in other words, your, what your fixed strategy is for applying PTFs and so forth. Another one that IBM I tends to not pay attention to is security awareness training. And the last one, an incident response team. So security awareness training means that your entire employee base has, that there is a process for helping them understand the need for security. So I like to call this the ability and the training so that you are equipping not just the IT team, but your entire employee base to fight against inappropriate use of data. I have seen this cut down the scope of PCI projects vastly because once you educate users on what is appropriate and what isn't, they'll come back and say, you know what, I have gotten this credit card information, I don't need the full card on this report. In fact, I don't need the card on this report at all. So take that one out of scope. Um, I have seen this apply to social security numbers where um, you know, a, a social security number was just requested 
on a form, and it, it doesn't even need to be requested anymore. So from not just credit card information, but employee awareness can reduce your organization's exposure to having too much private data and being exposed to those liabilities. So security awareness is really a good thing to do. Equip your entire employee base. Okay, the last one, and again, this last one is really where IBM iShops tend to fall down. And that's having a formal incident response team. So this is where you get together and you think of all the different types of incidents that can occur. Maybe a hacker breaches your, your network. Maybe an employee takes a set of proprietary information and sells it to a competitor. Uh, maybe you have a malware uh, that gets released in your organization. There's different types of incidences. But the idea is that you talk through those. First of all, you define the different types. And then you talk through what would have to happen to remediate that specific situation. Who the individuals are that need to be called to get together. Um, does legal need to be involved? Do you need to get your PR people involved? But I encourage you to get together and think about this before some sort of incident happens so that you aren't trying to pull that team together in the throes of investigating an incident or trying to remediate an incident. Really a valid piece of IT strategy and structure, but it is largely ignored in the IBM I community. So the next section talks about how I, uh, Skyview products can help. And with this, I will turn it back over to JD. Thank you, Carol. Um, I know we just have a couple of minutes here. If you do have further questions, please contact us at skyviewpartners.com or give us a call on any of this. One of the things that you all are going to receive at the end of this session is a white paper that's going to cover a lot of this material. Um, and if you page down through what Carol has put in her white paper, there is going to be an appendix on achieving PCI with uh, Skyview Partners uh, software. This is a bit of an eye chart, so let me make it just a little bit less of one here, uh, covering exactly what Carol talked about, specific requirements, uh, requirement for uh, regular review, which Skyview Risk Assessor uh, is, is built for. Uh, requirements for uh, limiting system components, uh, establishing control, again, solutions on how PolicyMinder can help you attain and maintain those compliance standards, um, specific requirements listed further down uh, in this document on establishing uh, automated audit trails for various items. Again, the Skyview Audit Journal Reporter can help you with those items. So everyone will get a copy of this. If you're watching this live, you'll get a copy. If you're watching the recorded version of this and you don't get a copy of this document, please contact us again at www.skyviewpartners.com and we'll be happy to help you. And with that, we're at the top of the hour. There were some questions 